All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our masterclass series. This is the final program in our five part series that we've conducted with the, the wonderful CME group. And tonight's presentation is going to be wonderful. We've got uh, a very experienced person in the industry uh, in terms of the energy products. Uh, so tonight's presentation is trading the WTI, which stands for West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil and Natural Gas with Futures Products via the CME Group, the CME Exchange. Uh, my name is Cameron Buchanan, uh, or Cam. Most people call me, who know me from our company, our Trading Academy. And tonight's special guest, who I'll introduce very soon, is Nicholas Dupuy, and uh, we're very excited to have Nicholas on. So. We'll, we'll get to Nicholas very, very soon. Before we we start, just need to go through some of the introductions for tonight. And uh, we, as people are flowing in, we've it was it was I, I turned the webinar on around about um, quarter two, and uh, there was a big stream of people already waiting. So it was a it's a very very uh, keen and eager group tonight. So thank you so much for joining. We've really appreciated your support through this entire uh, uh, process or this entire masterclass series. And it's also good to have an understanding of your background as well. So if anyone here is already currently trading oil or any products with the CME group, any futures products with the CME group or any other type of uh, product in the, in the marketplace, it'd be great to know your level of experience. So if you just want to type in the question panel uh, what your experience level is, if you've traded before, if you've traded any of the CME products, uh, list which products they are, just so that we can understand who you are a lot better. So tonight's presentation is we will run through some compliance slides because we are authorised by Beyond Capital Asset Management for the purpose of futures trading. So I do have to go through that uh, regulatory requirements. We're going to introduce our host as well, Nicholas, who's going to be uh, sharing his knowledge of the products so we have a deeper insight into oil and gas also i need to explain a little bit about our background uh, what idta does and our, our uh, i guess where we fit in the scheme of things tonight and also obviously nicholas is going to be exploring uh, the world of oil and gas futures i'll be going through some of the uh, contract specifications also talking a little bit about how we can trade these commodities, uh, some technical analysis, and then also we'll be opening up the uh, the mics. So if you have any questions for Nicholas or myself, uh, please do so. We'll be doing a, a extensive Q and A session at the end to wrap everything up. So that's the program for tonight. So quickly, I've already been through the the company we are authorised by. So we are. We work under Beyond Capital Asset Management. Their AFSL number there, the Australian Financial Services Licence is 484045. And this is for the purpose of futures trading education. I do have to let you know that if you do trade the futures products, uh, they do use margin. And this does carry a high level of risk, may not be suitable for all investors. Uh, there's a, a quick definition of margin there for you to, to have a read while I'm going through this, and I do encourage you to read the, the uh, caution notices as well. Basically it just says that um, we are borrowing money uh, to be able to trade position sizes a lot more than what we have in our account. So we all we need to, 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 uh, to cough up with is the margin and uh, the clearing house or the, the, the broker does carry the rest. Uh, now when you do it, when you are using money uh, that you're borrowing, it does have the effect of magnifying any profit or loss made on any trades, and this is why it's called high risk. There's a little bit more of a definition on 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 the margin. What that means it just means we're using leverage um, in our in the positions, and I'll talk about that in, when we get to the contract specifications. Also, there are two primary risks in trading. Trading there is an upside risk and a downside risk. I do have to let you know those risks so you can make money or gain money every time you take a trade. These are called winning trades. 
and you also have the risk of losing money every time you take a trade. These are typically referred to as losing trades. And also it's tonight's presentation is general information only. So we only give general advice. We can't give personal or um, about personal advice. So we're not financial planners um, and also past performance. So any trade recommendations I give you tonight, any of that is comes under the past performance. So past performance of this product is not and should not be taken as an indication of future performance. All right, so just be mindful of all those um, warnings. Now, uh, an introduction to myself. I've been conducting these programs with the CME experts and the representatives from the CME group over the last 10 weeks, and it's been a great experience for myself. I've learned so much about so many different products uh, as well. Um, I don't normally trade some of the products that, we, that we've that uh, we presented over the last 10 weeks, but uh, I've learned so much from some of the products and it's just given me a little bit more of a keen interest into understanding them. So it's been great knowledge. So thank you so much to the CME group. Uh, so my background is uh, I'm, a, I'm an educator, I'm a teacher. Uh, I, I'm a co-founder of the International Day Trading Academy, who I represent. Uh, I do have extensive history in the trading world, trading the futures markets, share trading. I'm very interested in market cycles, forecasting. Uh, also, I'm passionate about the science of peak performance, psychology uh, of trading, uh, which I find is a big part of trading performance. I also do write for Your Trading Edge magazine, which is one of the major trading magazines in Australia. I think it's one of the only trading magazines. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful uh, media uh, outlet for trading information, um, which is quite scarce uh, in Australia. Uh, so I do write a few articles for that magazine. A quick rundown about who we are, IDTA. We are a global enterprise. We have members in over 21 countries. We provide trading education and also financial investment systems alongside with our sister company beyond capital asset management uh, we provide uh, train, trained trading coaches mentors professional traders we provide a proprietary trading systems and indicators we also have uh, four or uh, five live that's actually four live trading rooms so we do us rooms european rooms and also asian rooms and this is where we call trades for our uh, members in that room we also have trading hubs, which are basically meetup groups for our members around the world. Uh, we have online hubs and also uh, hubs where you can physically get together. And uh, you know, we are a big, big fan of trading the futures markets due to the lifestyle that futures can offer us. So tonight we're going to be talking about trading the energy futures, primarily crude oil and uh, natural gas and before i hand over to nicholas and to introduce nicholas i just want to let you know that uh, the benefits of trading these energy products they are very volatile compared to other commodities uh, they're very tradable intraday so if you are a day trader or if you're interested in becoming a day trader uh, they're great products to trade it will uh, some of our members do trade the, the crude oil market in particular uh, and even natural gas is, is very tradable intraday as well. To give you an example, crude oil, uh, the CL, which is the, the little code, they call a ticker code for the product. Uh, it's one of the most actively traded uh, energy products, or so it's one of the actively traded uh, commodity products, actually. It's, I think it is one of the highest traded commodity products with over a million contracts traded per day. So it has enormous average daily volume. These markets are traded 23 hours a day, five days a week. It only turns off for 60 minutes, uh, but uh, and you get the weekends off, which is great also. And the wonderful thing about trading the CME products is that you're trading direct to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, so you don't deal with, um, you don't have to deal with any middlemen on the way. You can dire, uh, trade directly up onto the exchange. So that has a, a huge advantage for price transparency. And these products do create, the, the futures products do create the world benchmarks for these prices. So it has a, a huge influence over the price of the various commodities. So tonight I'd like to introduce to you Nicholas Dupuy. 
Uh, Nicholas serves as the Senior Director uh, for NG Products in the Asia Pacific region for the CME Group. He is responsible for leading the firm's energy business throughout the Asia Pacific region, including strategy, marketing and distribution of futures and options on the CME Globex platform. The Exchange Electronics, it's the electronic trading platform, as well as um, companies OTC Energy Clearing Services through CME Clearport. He also works closely with the Dubai Mercantile Exchange in the CME Group's strategic partner to cross-promote products and services. Prior to joining the company in September 2016, Nicholas was head of Energy Derivatives, uh, the Energy Derivatives Desk on the Asia Pacific region at Society General, where he was responsible for sales, trading, and clearing brokers' activities. Before that, Nicholas worked in various roles across trading and deal structuring and sales with Total and Society General. Nicholas holds a degree in mechanical, mechanical engineering from INSA in Lyon and a master's in technology management from EM Lyon. So I'd like to hand over the presentation and the microphone to Nicholas. Hey, Welcome Nicholas. Good evening everyone, I hope you can hear me and thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, so I hope um, that everyone can see my presentation. Okay, um, yes. good. So, first of all, good afternoon or good evening and thank you for joining uh, this uh, session uh, on uh, energy products. Um, I have to for, um, I have to start obviously with all disclaimer. So uh, the CME group lists uh, options and futures contracts uh, who have certain risk and are not suitable for all investors. And none of the things that I will share today should be perceived as a trade recommendation. So with that being said, um, our energy franchise on the CME group is uh, listed on NYMEX, the New York Mercantile Exchange, which is part of the group since 2000. And Eight. Uh, if you have already heard about of energy product, it's probably through our crude oil benchmark, WTI, or potentially uh, through our natural gas benchmark, uh, Henry App. So um, WTI is actually the most actively traded crude oil contract in the world, and the same thing for uh, natural gas for Henry App. So today I will focus on those two uh, contracts and uh, their respective market. As we talk about energy, um, let's have a look first at, uh, let's put things first in perspective. So the following chart uh, represent the primary energy consumptions by source uh, for the world. As you can see, uh, oil is ranked number one and represent around 30% uh, of the global energy demand, while natural gas is ranked number three with around 20, 25% of the global demand. So the data here, are um, the one from the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Agency, the EIA, was doing as well some nice forecasts in their projection uh, with uh, energy transition. Renewables energy um, are supposed to grow uh, very quickly, but even in this in this scenario, as you can see, uh, oil uh, will keep being very relevant in the futures with. Um, around 25% of the uh, energy pool, and natural gas will keep being ranked number three with a relatively stable market share. So in other words, uh, both oil and natural gas are relevant today and will remain relevant uh, in the years to come. So there is obviously lots of differences between crude oil and uh, natural gas. I would like to highlight uh, one, um, of, um, based on their fundamentals, and it, which is related to demand. So the previous slide represented the global energy demand. Um, the following pies uh, focus on the U.S. consumption, as both our contracts are primarily U.S. benchmark. In the U.S., uh, the uh, oil is the main source of primary energy, uh, followed by uh, natural gas. Now, if you look at why people are using uh, oil, 70% of it, it's uh, transportation fuel, okay? And actually, uh, if you look at the breakdown of transportation fuel in the US, 
uh, petroleum re still represents above 90 percent so when we talk about oil demand we basically still talk about transportation fuel for natural gas it's uh, very different uh, if you look at the in the u.s um, demand of natural gas for transportation is not relevant instead the main sectors consuming gas are uh, for power generation, so electricity, as well as uh, industrial sector. So it's important to keep this in mind because um, that obviously play a very important role in uh, price formation and movements of the market. So I mentioned that uh, WTI and Henry Hub are respectively the most actively traded futures contract for crude oil and natural gas in the world, which means that a lot of players are not, or a lot of traders are not uh, from uh, energy firm. So the question is why investors are adding uh, energy products into their portfolio. There's um, two main reasons for that. The first one is uh, portfolio diversification. So the following charts uh, represent historical prices for uh, WTI, Henry Hub, as well as S&P 500 and gold futures, COMEX gold future, which is as well one of uh, CME Group benchmark. I think that the graphs speak for themselves. Uh, there is absolutely no correlation with this uh, with these price movements. Now, if we want to look at it for more um, um, mathematical angle using correlation analysis, over the uh, recent period, that's the numbers uh, you can see on the right. And again, it's pretty obvious that uh, there is uh, almost no correlation or very weak correlation between uh, energy markets and uh, the other asset class. So portfolio diversification is one of the key reasons for people to look at energy. Now, the other one which has been already uh, mentioned is volatility. Uh, Energy market are extremely volatile. And, and let me be clear on, on that. That can be a reason for you to add energy to your portfolio or not to touch energy at all, because you might consider those products are too volatile. Um, this year, so sorry, the graph here are um, representing historical volatility. Uh, so CL is crude oil in dark blue, NG is natural gas, uh, in uh, ES is uh, S&P, and GC is uh, COMEX gold. So again, as you see on a historical basis, uh, energy markets are way more volatile than equity or gold. Uh, and if you look this year, oil market was on the roller coaster. Uh, price have stabilized now, but the volatility is still higher. Uh, by a long shot than, than uh, equities or gold. So again, it's something that every trader should consider uh, before entering into those markets. So now let's have a closer look at uh, crude oil and uh, WTI futures. I will start with the supply side as uh, the crude oil physical market has a unique feature with the existence of a cartel uh, of uh, producing countries uh, playing an important role in stabilizing, in theory, the market. The current OPEC members uh, mentioned on the left part of this chart with um, their respective production in million barrels per day, as it was at the beginning of this year. Uh, Saudi Arabia being by far the largest producer within OPEC. OPEC still represents 30% of roughly 30% of the global production, but there are as well two elephants in the room, uh, Russia and the US. Uh, the US became the largest producer of oil in the world back in 2018 with nearly 13 million barrels per day. Uh, Russia and other countries highlighted in, in dark blue on this chart are now cooperating with OPEC in what is called informally the OPEC plus alliance and the OPEC plus country decided this year uh, to cut drastically their production as the COVID-19 was taking a toll on oil demand. So by the way, uh, OPEC plus uh, have a very important meeting at the end of this month, December, uh, sorry, November 29, December 1st, when they will decide of uh, their next move. Another important point to understand um, is the different dynamics between uh, OPEC, which are basically a national oil company, and private firms like the old majors. Uh, majors and uh, private producers look at their break-even price, 
uh, to decide uh, any production adjustments, whereas national oil company who might enjoy lower production costs need to take into consideration as well other factors. As in, in a lot of cases, uh, national oil revenue uh, finance pretty much everything in their respective country. So coming closer to WTI futures, let's now have a look at the US market, uh, which is becoming more and more relevant globally for several reasons. Uh, first, uh, the US is both the largest producer and, and still the largest consumer of oil in the world. Um, second, as we have seen, US producers are, are private firms, okay, and their activity is not driven by politics, but really led by the forces of the markets. So, in other words, OPEC Plus is an informal regulator of the oil markets, while the US production is more of a barometer of the market. So the following chart represents the global US production in 1,000 barrels per day. Uh, that is the uh, blue line and numbers to be read on the left. So over the past 10 years, production has more than double, so which is a massive increase. Uh, this growth has been led by a couple of key regions, which are highlighted on these uh, charts and represented here with those lines. The numbers have to be read on the uh, right uh, hand. Uh, one region in particular in Brown, uh, in, in located in uh, western Texas and called Permian, have been, been really one of the key driver of uh, US production growth. And because of its location in, in western Texas, that's as well increased the significance of our WTI contract. So finally, let me come to our, our futures contract. So WTI, uh, crude oil, the quote is uh, CL. WTI stands for West Texas Intermediate, is the benchmark uh, for uh, North America, and more globally, it's used as a global benchmark for oil prices. Um, our contract is physically uh, delivered, but uh, which ensure, by the way, the convergence between future and spot prices. So it's a very, pot, a very important feature, and that's why uh, our contract is a benchmark, a real benchmark for the industry. Uh, but even if the contract is physically delivered, actually a very small portion of the trades are hold till uh, delivery, because most of the traders are closing their position or rolling their positions way before the contracts expire. On, on that, I think it's good to uh, remind everyone that it is the responsibility of the uh, a clearing broker uh, to make sure that as um, individual traders with no capacity in the physical oil market, you will have to close your position on time. Okay, So that's the responsibility of the clearing broker. So the contract is denominated in, in US dollar. Um, the size of the contracts is one contract for 1,000 barrel. The price increment is in cents per, uh, sorry, in, in US dollar cents, okay? So one tick, one uh, price increment is basically one cent multiplied by the size of the contract, $1,000. So one tick is $10, okay? So if the market moved by one cent, position for uh, one contract change is uh, valuation by $10. In terms of uh, listing cycle on energy, it's a very simple but it's different from, uh, from uh, the other markets because we are listing one contract per calendar month. Okay, So again, it's very different from the equities, which is on a quarterly basis, and other market like uh, agriculture. So on energy, you have one contract per calendar month. Uh, the spot months or active contracts is usually the more liquid, so the most active, and as well the most volatile. And gradually the liquidity is moving to the second line, so the second contract as we are getting closer to expiration. So it's a relatively simple process. So all the, um, I will stop there with the introduction of the contract. All the specifications are obviously available on CME Group uh, website. I would like to come back quickly on the um, fundamentals. And one thing which has been really a key driver of prices this year, uh, the impact of COVID-19 
on oil demand. So why is the pandemic having such an important impact on oil demand? If you remember what I shared before, uh, oil demand, it's mainly driven by transportation fuel. If we take the example of the US, again, the largest consumer in the world with nearly 20% of the global consumption, well, half of this consumption is actually linked to gasoline. So in other words, people driving their cars. So obviously with lockdowns and work from home mandates, uh, that had a very important impact on uh, oil gasoline demand in the US. As you can see in March, April, gasoline demand dropped by nearly 50%. Uh, that was in a time where New York went in lockdown and, and pretty much all the uh, uh, the big cities on the Atlantic coasts. Um, so gasoline demand dropped by 50%. It was not only in the US, the same happened in pretty much all the other uh, relevant uh, big oil consuming center. And this happened as well at the time when OPEC Plus couldn't agree on any production cost. So as you can imagine, um, drop in demand, producer don't change anything, price uh, collapse. So now the demand have been gradually restored, but it's still relatively uh, fragile. And it's a good reminder what happened in, in March, April, uh, sorry, March, April, yes, of uh, potentially what could happen uh, this winter if we see um, um, a continuous increase of new cases uh, in US and in Europe. Now, as you can already understand, there is a lot of things uh, if you want to analyze the fundamentals, uh, supply and demand. Uh, so that's why a lot of institutional traders uh, rather focus on inventories or um, storages. Okay, uh, Inventories are a reflection of the imbalances between supply and demand. Uh, it's a nice way or easy way to assess if the market is over or under supplied. Uh, the US is, by the way, the only market where uh, inventory reports are published on a weekly basis. Uh, traders focus a lot on one specific report from the EIA, uh, which is released every uh, Wednesday at 10.30 Eastern time, so that's during all nights uh, here in this region. Uh, so it's always a, a moment widely anticipated by traders. Uh, there might be some volatility around the publication in particular if the data are not in line with the market consensus. There are some uh, other reports, notably the API report, which comes one day before, but by far the most important is the EIA. Uh, and the good thing about the EIA is that all the data are in the public domain, including historical data back to the time of Rockefeller, and uh, you can download all those data in Excel. So it's a very convenience if you want to have your own chart and follow exactly what is um, the situation of the US inventories. Uh, by the way, you might have noticed that a lot of information contained in, in this presentation are coming from the EIA. It's a very uh, powerful uh, source of information. And as they focus on the US market, it's extremely relevant for WTI traders. So uh, it's not all about fundamentals, obviously. Um, you have as well a lot of financial players in that market and um, their position can be a good indicator of the market sentiment. So as for all other contracts or regulator, the Commodity Futures uh, Trading Commission, CFTC, publish a report on a weekly basis called the Commitment of Traders with uh, the short and long position of the large, largest players in this market. There is a so-called disaggregated COT, uh, which is split by a type of clients. The market focus a lot on the third category, which is called uh, managed money, which means basically investors, or sometimes called speculators. Um, so it's released every Friday. Now, I would like to mention, so you can find on the web a lot of um, articles on how to read the COT report. Um, here, what I would like to uh, mention is that on the CME uh, group website, you can find a very nice tool uh, where you can track actually uh, the position from each of those category and uh, all our products. So for WTI, uh, again, the, the 
indicator that traders are following it's the net long position of managed money which is a very important indicator to assess the market sentiment so um the last thing uh, to mention about crude oil uh i mentioned fundamentals uh, but oil market is 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 really becoming a bit more of a financial market in the sense that uh, macroeconomic news uh, might have an influence as well on prices. Uh, of course, technical data is always very relevant. Uh, geopolitics as well is moving uh, oil price a lot. So overall, it's sort of, it's very fun uh, to trade crude oil. Uh, very interesting. I've been in this market for 21 years, and um, honestly, every year is bring something new. Uh, and some excitement, so uh, very interesting. With that, uh, we'll move to uh, natural gas, which is as well a very exciting market, but um, I won't lie, it is a bit less popular than oil with uh, individual traders. Uh, it has as well some key characteristic, uh, probably not so obvious for everyone that I will try uh, quickly to, to, um, to, to introduce to everyone. Uh, the main one is that natural gas demand is seasonal. So if you remember what I uh, um, said at the beginning of this presentation, um, the reason why people are using gas, it's uh, for instance, um, to produce electricity, so power generation. So in the US, there is a peak of electricity demand in summer when people are using a lot of uh, aircon devices. But by far the biggest seasonality, or rather said, the biggest increase in demand comes in winter. Um, so again, not to be confused with Australian winter, I'm talking here about Northern Hemisphere uh, winter. So roughly October to March, okay? There is a big peak in demand for basically uh, heating houses and, and buildings. So a huge volatility, sorry, a huge seasonality in uh, the demand. Demand is seasonal, but production is not seasonal. And as for crude oil, the US have uh, seen a massive growth of their natural gas production over the past 10 years. Okay, uh, Notably with uh, the states of Texas and Louisiana, which together uh, represents uh, around 30% of the US production. Those two states, you can see on the map, are uh, located on the US Gulf Coast, so the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this is relevant for two reasons. First, um, because all contract hand rehab is physically delivered in Louisiana. And the second one is because those uh, states are impacted by hurricanes. And hurricane can have an impact on, on production. Again, production is not seasonal, but sometimes when you have a massive hurricane, some of the fields needs to be shut down. To be clear, a uh, hurricane does not only have an impact on uh, production, it has as well an impact on demand. When uh, states are flooded by heavy rain or hit by a hurricane, uh, some power plants have to be shut down and some electric lines are cut, So, which means uh, the natural gas demand collapse as well. So, consumption is seasonal, production is not seasonal. How do you balance the market? Well, import export can be one way, but um, the way the US natural gas market is uh, balancing itself, and it's the same in Australia, sorry, in, in Europe, in Japan, is by inventories, okay? So, in the US, you have um, gas, which is injected into storage in Q2 and Q3 when the demand is slower and then withdrawn from this uh, storage in winter time, so Q4 and Q1. As for oil, um, this means that inventories and following inventories is uh, very important when you want to uh, analyze the markets because the, um, there is a cycle of uh, um, inventory build and drawn uh, that repeat itself every year and what the traders are focusing on is what is the situation of the current gas injected into storage at this time of the year and how it compares to previous cycle so it's uh, some things that uh, every natural gas traders will follow 
And as for crude oil, all the data are available and published on a weekly basis by the EIA. In that case, um, it published on Thursday at 10.30 Eastern time, so one day uh, um, following, one day after the uh, oil report. So again, something uh, important that you need to at least be aware of if you want to trade natural gas. So now let's have a quick look at our futures contract, which is called the Henry Hub Natural Gas Futures. So uh, Henry Hub is um, the price reference for all the US natural gas market. It's as well the backbone of prices for North America, as well as the price reference for US LNG, so liquefied natural gas exported by cargo. Um, so therefore, it's as well a key indicator of LNG prices. The contract is um, physically settled, but as for WTI, most of the positions are closed or rolled before expiration. The contract is denominated in US dollar. Um, for commodities, there is always a unit. In that case, the unit of the contract is 10,000 MMBTU. MMBTU stands for million British term units. So one contract equals 10,000 MMBTU. In other words, the notional value of one contract is 10,000 times the price. In that example, two years ago, I was around $3 per uh, MMBTU, which is still the same case today. Uh, that's a coincidence. Uh, the price increment is one tenth of a cent. Um, the contract, just like WTI, is uh, liquid on screen, 23 hours a day. The bid ask spread is very tight, which makes it so very convenient to trade. Um, the listing cycle, as for oil, you have one contract per calendar month. The front months or active contract is usually uh, the one which is the more uh, liquid and followed by the second one and so on and so forth. The last thing I want to mention is that the seasonality I've just explained is reflected into the forward curve. So I will uh, insist a little bit on that because it's important in particular for traders who might want to keep an open position uh, and roll it as the contract expires. There is a big seasonality in the forward uh, which is represented in the forward curve. So for those who are not familiar with this terminology, what's, what, what is a forward curve? Well, a forward curve is what I represent here on this chart is basically a graphic representation of a trading or closing price for each maturities of a futures contract. Okay, so you can see here for NG, uh, contract listed, uh, that was at the time, so from December, sorry, from October uh, 20, uh, up to three years forward, and for each month, you put the, the price, and that gives you the curve. As you can see, you have um, a nice uh, roller coaster as well, with what we call contango uh, shape, so basically price moving up in winter, and then a backwardation uh, during the the injection period. So that's very important. I won't spend too much time on that, but it's uh, important again for traders who want to hold their position, so get net long, for instance, and keep this position over time. Uh, the, the rolling natural gas futures has a certain cost, and you need to understand this mechanism. So what are the major factors affecting natural gas prices? Uh, I mentioned already uh, fundamentals, of course, supply, demand, inventories. Um, another difference, important difference with oil, the natural gas market um, is not yet completely globalized, it's, which means uh, it still focuses a lot on local uh, supply and demand. In other words, it's uh, pretty much immune to geopolitics. Okay, so geopolitics can have a big impact on crude oil prices. It has a lower impact on natural gas prices. But on the other end, um, and I, I think I insisted a lot on that, uh, seasonality means that the demand depends on weather. And as we all experience in our life, weather curve forecasts are not accurate, uh, which means that a lot of volatility depending on variation of temperature, uh, change in weather forecasts. So usually when you trade natural gas, you follow weather forecasts. So in that case, you, US weather forecast, 
Um, the EIA as well provides some very useful tools on their website uh, with average temperature, so it's relatively easy to follow. So um, I think that with that, I'm done with this presentation. So yeah, again, that's uh, one of the tools that you can find on the uh, EIA website where you will find a, a quick summary of the gas put into uh, inventories, how it looks like compared to the previous years, and a temperature uh, in each region uh, compared to, to the normal ones. So with that, I um, will end my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions during the Q&A. Thank, thank you, Nicholas. Um, I'm just going to bring my slides up. Can everyone see that now? I've just changed that over. Yep. Yep, yeah, should be should be presenting. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, just get my camera working. There we go. Right, wonderful information. Uh, thank you so much, Nicholas, for that. Uh, interesting um, about. Uh, I just I missed. I just want to ask you one quick question about the gas. Does the gas uh, contracts? I missed the contract dates, but are they are they monthly, like oil or, or CL? Yeah, they or are. They are, they are yeah. yeah, they are monthly. They are monthly. Yeah, so monthly. the only difference is that the expiration date is slightly different for uh, each of our energy products. But that's really a general rule on the energy uh, market in uh, for every product, not only a gas and natural gas, but it's the same for coal, gasoline, uh, you name it. Mm -hmm. We always use one contract per month. Um, it's very simple. Yes. Yeah. And it's been interesting. I've been looking at the natural gas price and it's you know, since 2009, it's just been going in this, this large downtrend for such a long time. Um, it's It looks like it's like a really, from my perspective, coming into a really bottom price. Like it, it sort of can't get any lower. So it'd be looking looking like a very good opportunity to, to buy this floor at the moment. So I'll, I'll show you some technicals on it, but um, it's, it's very interesting how it has been on such a, a downward uh, a downward um, curve. Uh, if we if we look at the contract specs, and this is uh, Nicholas did mention this, but I will reinforce this for anyone who is interested in trading uh, the CL contract, crude oil futures. Uh, it's a very popular contract to trade, as as Nicholas mentioned. There's you know millions of contracts traded, or million over a million contracts traded, average on a daily basis. So it's a very tradable market. And I'll show you, I'll pull up some of the charts um, to show you even from a, on a five minute scale, just how th there's so much volatility uh, on a daily basis. Um, so it's, it's very important to know the, the contract specifications and uh, to understand them. There is a lots of, a lot of our traders, as I said, trade CL as a, as a second market. Especially if, for instance, if you're an index trader uh, and it's, you're finding that market's a little bit slow, uh, have, have a look over at the oil market, and you'll be, you know, you'll be, you might, you know, get a day where it's, it's very high volatility. So it does give you that optionality if you are just trading one market um, and uh, you you a little bit quiet on or it's untradable the, the market you're trading. Have a look at the oil market or gas market, but it's, you know especially the oil market because it is very tradable. Uh, and as uh, Nicholas mentioned, uh, one contract is a thousand barrels, so you multiply everything by a thousand. So, for instance, a tick. So the, the smallest price move is is one is um, one cent. So the dollar value of that one tick move is ten dollars. So. Um, the leverage disregard that leverage unfortunately i don't know why i kept that in there that's that's incorrect the leverages are not that um the leverages will will depend on the margins and who you're using so please disregard the leverages there um and uh, natural gas obviously once again it's a benchmark of of for trading natural gas um uh, it is traded 23 hours a day five days a week contract size is 10,000 million 
British thermal units. So the tick size is that one tenth of a cent. And once again, it is US dollars. So we are trading in US dollars. And uh, the tick is once again, the same size. So it's $10 tick in dollar value. So, um, and there's a, a quick breakdown. So for instance, for people seeing this for the first time, you know, the oil only has to move one, uh, 10 cents and it's the contract value is $100 per contract. So very, and this is the reason why so many people day trade the futures markets, not only is it transparent, you're getting everyone seeing the same price information, but the leverage is, is enormous. So uh, if you can, you know, you can trade high frequency in these markets, take little scalps out of the market on a daily basis. And, you know, that uh, gives you a potential to, to earn an income on a daily basis. And that's what why a lot of people day trade the futures markets. So once again, natural gas, uh, it only has to move one cent and it is worth uh, basically $100, just a one cent move in that market. So let's go and have a look at some of the the oil and gas forecasts. I found it, I've got to say, I found it very tricky to, to forecast gas because uh, I can show you some of the, the, the Fibonacci levels I've used to sort of to see some correlations with what, what it's been doing uh, in the past to see if that's going to repeat in the future. Uh, but also looking at some horizontal lines, so some horizontal support and resistance, uh, any, and some diagonal levels as well in the market. So what I'd like to do first of all is uh, let's have a look at oil because it's the first one we looked at today. And I'm going to look at a, a weekly chart of the current contract. And when I scrunch this up, for these people seeing this for the first time, an oil chart, this is a weekly chart. And you know, one thing that it's very clear when you look at this, this goes all the way back to the 2011, which was, you know, that was the, the real high in the commodities markets. Like we saw gold at all time highs, uh, all the commodities prices were at their all time highs uh, a few years after the GSC. The, the commodities cycle, uh, there, there's a, a thing called the Kondratiev wave, who was a Russian economist who was employed or commissioned by Joseph Stalin back, back, you know, early. 1900s uh, or mid 1900s after the after the um, when the the Russian uh, Bolsheviks got into power and the uh, the Russian communists got into power after Lenin's time and obviously Stalin was one of the a, a very long term leader who really um, who really altered Russia's future kept it very suppressed for many years but um, there was a particular economist in that time. Uh, Kondratiev, Nikolai Kondratiev, his, his work is phenomenal. Uh, he does a lot of work on commodity cycles and he, he, the Kondratiev wave basically represents that there's waves from peak to peak or trough to trough, generally around about 50 years or so. And uh, it, you know, this, this research went back to the early 1800s and it's very, very interesting to look at. But, Kondratiev was, was saying, based on his analysis, that we are in an upwards commodity cycle at the moment. And uh, we're obviously in that retracement phase of that cycle uh, because we, uh, a lot of the commodities had a huge run uh, in, I'm just grabbing my cursor here, pointer. And a lot of these commodities had massive runs uh, into the GFC and just after the GFC. However, we have seen a retracement, but Kondrati, of, if you look at Kondrati's work, it does say that we are going into a very, um, a very strong cycle or the, or the end of the cycle. And generally the end of these cycles can be quite pronounced. So I would expect to see over the next decade uh, that commodities have found a, a flaw, but the, the commodities are generally going to increase in price all around all all commodities uh we you know we, we are going into a, a very large uh, uh if you look at some of the the, uh, the work by fred harrison or uh, phil anderson in australia on the property markets and property cycles real estate cycles 
uh, we're going to a very bullish real estate cycle over the next uh, five years as well. So if that continues or if that starts to happen, uh, we will see the, that these commodities will start to increase. So if we look at oil, you can see oil was up around that $140, $150 a barrel uh, in 2011. And if you're an Elliott Wave um, student, you would notice that this has been a very, very impulsive, bearish move. Uh, we've had basically three very strong waves to the downside. And uh, this is potentially setting up for a reversal in this market. So uh, oil could, I could definitely see, obviously depend, dependent a lot on what's happening uh, with the virus. Uh, obviously there's been a lot of great news in terms of vaccine thing. Uh, and vaccine news is really keeping the markets buoyant right now, really pushing the indexes up. And uh, if the, the vaccine, if we don't have those lockdowns that uh, Nicholas mentioned, those lockdowns did affect the prices immensely. Uh, you can see how immensely it did affect the prices, like prices went from $70 a barrel down to around $10 a barrel. I think it even went negative at one point uh, briefly, but you know, 2000, 2020 has been a very, uh, very bearish year for uh, commodities especially oil and, uh, or not, not so much gold, but oil and uh, gas has been very bearish. And you can see this, this final leg here, or this final wave down, potentially this will be the, the final move um, uh, down. And now we're gonna start to see the market start to move back up, so on a weekly level. Uh, if I just go in a little bit more of a bird's eye view and, and go in a bit closer here, I know a bird's eye view, more of a, a, a microscopic view of what's happening is I have put up a few key levels on the short term. So for any of the day traders out there, certain levels to be looking at, uh, specific levels, what I've done here, I've drawn a retracement, a Fibonacci retracement from the last big move down that we had this year uh, in March and April. And you can see that the market has recovered back to around that, about that 50% of that move. So it's quite stable. Apparently the price, by looking at that chart, we have done a, a nice bounce recovery back to the 50% level around that $41 and a half dollars. Um, as Nicholas mentioned, it's very important if you are day trading this mar the oil market is to watch those inventories every Thursday morning, very early, about 1.30 in the morning Queensland time. Um, you'd have to adjust your watches based on what your time zone, but that is a very popular time to trade, day trade the, the, the oil market because of the, the volatility around the news, the inventory news. So we're seeing here on the, recently over the last um, few months, we've seen that oil is in this kind of retracement type consolidation phase. However, we have broken out of this, this somewhat of a down or this corrective channel and the market is holding above. So look, it really depend, dependent on what OPEC says in terms of their, if they're gonna increase, um, uh, decrease production or, or, or add more production cuts to that, that could have a significant effect on the price. And if it does, we could see the market moving up to this $50 mark uh, quite rapidly. So that could be an interesting, uh, interesting one to watch um, when the OPEC meetings um, meet at the end of this month. So that's the, the weekly chart. The next chart I will show you is a daily chart. And, and on the daily chart, there's a, a little bit more, more levels here. Interesting to note, I've just done a few time counts from highs to lows. And it's interesting how the market is quite, is quite balanced. You can see here we've had 104 days down. Um, from the start of, um, of uh, the year. And then you can see the markets recovered back to that 50% level here, around 41 and a half, around, um, around this price here. You can see we've sort of hovered around that area. Uh, very interesting, but it's interesting how it took 105 days to make that peak. So it's quite a unique balance between um, the highs to lows and lows to highs. And now 
the last low was made around 90, um, 90 days, right? From that high to that low has been 90 days. So we could be seeing the market, you know, basically moving back up higher. If we look and we see that last retracement, there is a little bit of resistance and a lot of our traders love looking at that 90% retracement of that move down. You can see there is a, a double top at that level. So there is a little bit of a resistance up around that 43 and a half mark. But if we get above 43 and a half, I think we're definitely going to move up towards 40, 41, um, upwards to 42, basically a retest of this 44 level. So there is, you know, for a day trader looking for a, a few cents out of this market, uh, there is definitely some potential once we, if you're using these levels, uh, very much look for the market to break above 90 and move up to the retest the, the prior high around 44 and a half. Now, if we do have a, a another COVID uh, situation, we could see this market coming back down and definitely retesting that 38.2 Fibonacci or that $34 mark, which is where the market retested uh, when the market has been pulling back over the last few months since that August high. So interesting market to look at. I want to show you too, for any day trader that's out there, uh, we do look at these very small term uh, scales, uh, the five minute charts. And if you're just looking at this, this particular chart uh, for, for crude oil, if you can see here, this was from um, the 24th. Um, so yesterday, uh, this is yesterday in the US. So this is the opening time. So this is nine o'clock in on the east coast of, uh, of of Australia or Queensland, I should say. This is when the market actually opens at uh, nine o'clock here. You can see the market closes at eight o'clock as 60 minutes off. So this is when the market opens. And you can see here the European market had an incredibly large move um, on this day. So a lot of bullish activity in this European session. And that is a large, large move. Like that is, guys, to give you an idea, that's a basically in terms of contract value, that is basically 100, 200, 300, 400, 5, 6, 700, around about a $1,200 move from that low from 4230 upwards to 43.30. Well, it's about a, a really a, a $1,000 move, I should say, from there. So that's a 100 tick move um, moving from there. And that's and that was during the European or or the, um, uh, basically the, the very early in the European markets uh, all the way through to the European Open. And then we saw the market um, pull back and uh, be quite volatile through the US session all the way through to the closing session. But if you look at the volume down here, if I if I bring up the volume bars and I'll just get rid of that, you can see the volume is very high from around the European open, around about six o'clock or the, the five o'clock, I should say, the pre-markets all the way through. But you'll notice that the majority of the volume is traded in those US market hours. So if you're staying up late to trade the US pre-market, you know, the traditional 11 o'clock, which is the traditional US uh, um, the oil open when they when they were trading on the floor hours. It used to be 11 o'clock uh, Queensland time or uh, actually it's now it's 12 p.m. Queensland time is the traditional oil open. You can see the uh, volume is, is very high, typically around that um, around that uh, traditional opening time. But you can see the volume is very large. Um, and it's a very, very day tradable product. Okay, not only for longer term trading, but it is also very good for day trading as well. Um, let's have a look at the the gas. Uh, I'm not a, a big gas. Uh, haven't been watching gas at all, but it, um, if, I'm, if I looked at today, what I what I did see, if I look at the weekly chart, first of all. Can see once again very similar type structure to oil um, in terms of its in terms of its like this big three wave move down. Interesting to note the last big move down on uh, gas it seemed to 
get stuck at this 75% extension. So from the high down to the low, back up to the, to the higher low, you can see, oh, sorry, the lower high, you could see that the market had pushed down and, and fell at that 75. Now, if that behavior exists, uh, uh, continues, you can see from, from, uh, from here to here, so from here to here, I've just drawn another Fibonacci extension from there to there back up to that high, that lower high. You can see where we've released it, it's down on that 75% extension, very similar to what it did in the last cycle. So if that type of you know, behavior or that technical behavior continues, then, then we could potentially see that the market here has found a bottom and that natural gas may potentially start to increase its price from here. So if you're looking for a long-term play, uh, a long-term hold, then gas could be in a situation here to look for a longer-term move. I would be definitely waiting for this market to do what we call a swing trigger. So what, what that means is that we need to see the market make a high, pull back and fail, almost make a double bottom, um, and then go again and try and buy from as close to as possible from that second bottom. That would be a, a swing on the weekly charts and they're very, very powerful trading opportunities um, for any of the swing traders that are out there would know about that. Um, and if I look at the daily chart as well, we can see here that the market has, uh, on a recent level, has found some wave quality. We're also um, this is a daily chart. You can see we're finding a bit of support down here at this trend line. We saw the market just try to break through, but it's failed. So once again, I'd be looking for, you know, I'd be waiting maybe a few weeks or so uh, for a longer term play. Obviously, day traders, there's, there's obviously moves all day, especially during the US uh, market openings. There's obviously a lot more volatility, a lot more um, contracts on offer to move. But uh, you can see that from this diagonal resistance levels here, that there is a few points of resistance to the upside here, and also we found some nice support to the downside. So it looks like there's going to be potential, maybe a retest of this trend line. And if if it does retest and it can bounce off that level, we could see the market definitely moving back up to the high side. So um, interesting way to analyze these charts, but I think there's some really good uh, potential longs. On, on this market on, on the longer term, on the natural gas market. So, um, if I just move some of these charts. So just basically to really summarize um, oil, um, oh, should go back, sorry. Uh, if, we, if we look at oil, uh, some of the key prices here, uh, the market is in consolidation. And we've seen that over the last few few months, the market is consolidating. Uh, there is upside targets, 43.50 is one of those levels to look for. Also, if it can break that 43.50, I'd be looking for 44.50 as the next key level because that is the most recent high and there's a massive gap that the market has to fill as well. And if the market is filling that gap, which I'll show that gap, I didn't, I didn't highlight it enough, that there is a large gap um, here, right here. Okay, so there's a gap from these highs all the way up to this 61.8% FIB or this $50 mark. Uh, there's a big move from there to there. And generally those gaps, they get filled very quickly when they start getting um, filled in. They'll move quickly. So there is a very good move back up to the 49.44, which is that 61.8% retracement and that gap fill. Now, if it fails 44.50, and uh, we, if we do get some negative news uh, in terms of the COVID and some shutdowns and some large outbreaks and some lockdowns, then we'll see that this market would potentially uh, come back down to 44.50. And if it uh, fails, or sorry, if it breaks 44.50 and fails, or it can't break 44.50, we've got support at 37. We've got also support down at 33.50. So there's some key support levels to the downside. And uh, I will emphasize this also that we've got a conversion of three cycles uh, in, in this decade that we're seeing right now. We're going to see the, the largest boom of all time in the real estate market. And we're also going to see 
the peak of the Kondratia 50 year wave. And that is generally is um, it's quite exciting for prices of commodities to go up. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next five to 10 years uh, for commodities, especially oil and gas. Uh, gas is pretty tricky to analyze right now because we've just in this, been in this massively bearish five wave downtrend since 2009. Um, interesting that wave three and wave five have found support, that 75 extension. So could this be the bottom or the end of this bearish cycle? So like I said, look for the first swing long on the weekly chart. This could be a very good long-term play any gas uh, people looking, uh, look, any investors looking to hold gas. Just be very mindful, and I will emphasize what Nicholas said, if you are trading these markets, you must be very mindful of the rollover of contracts. So if you've never traded futures for the first time, uh, if you've never traded futures before, and it's the first time looking at futures, you need to be very mindful of that contract rollover. And uh, it's very easy once you, once you learn about it, uh, you just need to have an understanding of when those contracts are rolling over. So when the volume moves from the current contract to the future contract, you need to be on the ball with that. Okay. So just be very mindful. Even if you're an investor, you still need to watch um, from time to time to see what is happening and when the contracts are rolling over. And it's a simple case of just selling and then buying back into the new contract if you're holding on a long-term perspective. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the completion of tonight's presentation on my part. We do have some a Q and A. Uh, I do have some questions coming through, uh, so bear with me while I bring that up. So, if you do have any questions for Nicholas, uh, please um, ask. Just give me some moment to read these. Okay, so somebody was asking here, um, with the futures contracts that we typically trade, are the contracts obligated to take physical delivery of the underlying commodity or are the contracts always settled in cash? Um, okay, yeah. Go ahead, Nicholas. May I, yeah, may I, may I take this one? So, uh, none of it. Uh, so, you are not... Um, you're not forced to go to um, a physical delivery. Actually, as I said before, it's the responsibility of your clearing broker um, to identify whether or not you are in a position to take delivery of the contract. So when mm -hmm. you trade the futures, you always have a middleman uh, who is there to manage basically the margin on your behalf. Uh, we are not collecting margin directly from you. We're, um, uh, collecting as in exchange or uh, as a clearinghouse margin from a broker. So ultimately, the financial responsibility for us lies with the broker. And the broker, when they onboard uh, any traders, they will do uh, um, a quick survey or KYC process to know exactly what type of uh, traders you are. If you are an individual, it will be a no-no. You will never be allowed to keep your position till uh, delivery. You're not Shell, you're not BP. Mm. Okay, so yeah, um, so you will have to close or roll up positions because if I come back to those two contracts I introduced today, CL or NG, there is no cash settle mechanism. Okay, so there is a, a, a back doors when you hold the position till expiration, and oh, I'm I'm an individual tra individual trader, I cannot take delivery or make delivery, so. Uh, alternative mechanism, cachetto. No, that doesn't exist, okay? Mm -hmm. The contract all the expiration goes to delivery, but again, way before that happen, your clearing broker will tell you, you are not allowed to keep your position beyond a certain day. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They'll just close you out of the, out of the trade or, or inform you anyway. Yeah, Absolutely. usually they inform. Usually they do it. Some uh, usually traders are know that, but in case you forget a few days before 
uh, the deadline, they will they will start telling you, you know, keep in mind that you will have to close your position by, let's say, tomorrow or in two days. Uh, ultimately, if you don't do anything, they will take action on your behalf. But usually, they give you enough uh, warning time so that you have plenty of times to uh, manage smoothly your position. And again, the market remains extremely liquid. Um, so even if you have one, 10 lots or 100 lots, you will find enough liquidity to uh, exit your positions relatively uh, smoothly. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, somebody asked, uh, Kerry asked a question just relating more to uh, our trading style being uh, day traders. Uh, can we trade our trading strategy uh, using the, you know, our IDTA signals and uh, algorithms? Yes, definitely. Um, it will just be mindful of the volumes. Um, just if you're obviously if you're taking very small targets out of the market, uh, just you know those times like if you're trading oil or, or gas in those uh, quieter times, like around there. But oils has, has a, probably a lot more volatility or a lot more volume, I should say, than, than gas uh, during the Asian market. So, but you, you can definitely trade. Uh, using a five-minute chart, um, all all the signals that we do is still valid. Uh, the way you read the market is still valid. And as I said before, we we do have many traders that do trade oil uh, on the side. It's one of their their their. They all either have gold or oil as a very you know there's two popular uh, large very large uh, contracts that uh, are traded. So yes, you can carry. That's a, a great question. Now, do we have any other, any further questions uh, flowing through? Um, Nick, what is the typical leverage ratio to futures trade with and what account balance would you recommend for trading one contract? Uh, well, it, it really comes down to in general just some general advice here uh first of all you in terms of margins it'll depend on your clearing broker like who you use um the clearing broker we use uh the intraday margins are discounted so they're around about it's around about thousand dollars for for cl uh, i'm not too sure what it is on natural gas off the top of my head uh but the crude oil is around about a thousand dollars Per contract, that's intraday. Uh, if you go, if you hold positions overnight, the margin does increase. Uh, I'm not too sure what the margin would be. I think it may be around about five times that, or three or four times that. I don't know exactly. Um, so you do need to have that amount of money in your account, plus you know any any uh, any risk that you're holding as well. You need to be able to manage that because if you do go beyond the margin so for instance if you you know let's say you've got a thousand dollar account um, or let's say you've got a, a twelve hundred dollar account uh, and you're in a trade an oil trade and the account goes below a thousand dollars so it means you're you're going down uh, you're in a minus position of say two hundred dollars plus then the clearinghouse will generally close you out of the trade um, because they, you need to keep that margin requirement of a thousand of a thousand dollars, so they uh, need to make sure that that's uh, kept by you. That's your that's your obligation to keep that um, uh, that margin intact. So uh, if you are trading, it really just comes down to your risk profile. Uh, industry standards anywhere from one to three uh, percent uh, at risk. So it'll really depend on, on your trading style, but um, yeah, look, you know, some people trade with a three to five thousand account to start with. Um, it really depends. It really depends on on your risk profile, what you're doing there. But um, just be very mindful of the margins. But the intraday margins are heavily discounted. So, and that's a great thing for day traders. You know, we we get in and out of the market. You know, we don't have any overnight exposure, or when the market's closed, um, we, we're done and dusted and uh, it's, it's you know it's, it's it puts a lot of traders at ease when they're when they're day trading the markets. But uh, yeah, great question, Nick. 
but yeah if you've got any you know if you've got any further advice uh, if you want further advice um, let us know we actually do have a and I will introduce this as well as that we do have a master class tomorrow night for anyone interested in learning to day trade the futures markets you know oil any of the markets gas markets that we mentioned tonight uh, indexes or any of the products that we've mentioned over the, the last 10 weeks when we've done the, the five masterclass series. Um, if you're interested to find out more about how you can get involved in trading these markets, how to open up trading accounts, all those things, we are having a, a webinar for any of those people that are interested tomorrow. And you can find that, uh, you can register for that at our website, www.idta.com.au and uh, you can go to our events page and we run our weekly webinars there at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. So it'll be myself and Lockie Ellsworth, uh, the co-founder of IDTA, and we'll explain how you can uh, trade these markets. Uh, now, I don't think there's any more questions, but what I would like to make mention uh, before, before we go is that uh, as a special gift, uh, sorry, as a special gift, as you've been a guest of our of ours over the last uh, ten weeks or five sessions, we will be sending out all of the replays of all of the series to you. So uh, you will expect that in your inbox over the next few days. Uh, just thank you for coming. There will be a review of all of the uh, uh, recordings of all of the five sessions, all the way back from the first one, which was. Um, uh, gold and metals and then we did the uh, US indexes we did US um, we did Forex or FX products so uh, current uh, foreign currency uh, products and we also did agricultural products as well as the NG products tonight so I look forward to that and uh, I've got one more question here before we go um, If I want to trade two markets, would I need two times five thousand accounts? Or no, it can all work. It can all work through the one account. Yeah, it can all all work through the one account. You just need to be able to balance the the, um, the margins. That's all. You just need to make sure that if you, you know, most most people, uh, if you're trading overnight positions or longer term positions, you just got to be mindful of the the combined margin of both those markets. All right. But uh, once again, thank you, Nicholas, for, for joining us and being a part of our, uh, our masterclass series over the last 10 weeks. It's been very enjoyable. I hope you've gained great knowledge and wisdom and knowledge about the CME products. They are uh, you know, a very powerful organization. They've been uh, holding and creating these markets for many, many years, for hundreds of years now. Uh, and uh, they're still going strong and just growing even more. So. Uh, if you are interested in trading the futures markets as a day trader or a longer term trader or as an investor they're, they're a great way to, to manage risk but also to extract money out of the markets on a daily basis it does give you that opportunity uh, if you manage your risk very well so thank you so much for joining thank you nicholas thank you to the cme group and everyone involved uh good night and uh have a lovely rest of the week bye for now